Everything we design today comes with a blueprint. No matter how impressive a device or structure is, we understand how it was built, which materials were used to create and shape it, and how it was all put together. We can't say the same thing about some of the incredible structures that were created in the distant past. Our ancestors created some truly phenomenal buildings, objects, and devices, and we're at a loss to know how they did it. We might know some of the processes, but not all of them. That makes everything you're about to see in this video a big mystery. Having central heating is essential to any home or apartment built today. Without it, we'd all freeze in the winter. Most of us tend to think that central heating is a comparatively modern invention, but it isn't. The first ever central heating system was introduced by the ancient Romans 2,000 years ago, and they called their creation the hypocost. Only the wealthiest people alive at the time could afford a hypocost system, but according to the writings of the philosopher Seneca, those who could pay for it enjoyed a soft and regular heat spread throughout their homes by a system of tubes. While home use was a luxury, hypocausts were a common feature at public bathhouses. The system involved creating spaces below the floors and between walls, and elevating floors above the foundation level using brick pillars. A fireplace would be placed into a corner of the building, and the heat from the fire circulated below the floor. Given that there are still parts of the world where central heating isn't available today, it's almost miraculous that the Romans were so far ahead of the time with this invention. If you think that the steam engine was invented around the same time as the first train, you're in for a shock. It's actually an ancient piece of technology created by Alexandrinus, a genius who is better known to history as Hero of Alexandria. He may not have fully understood the potential of the device he created when he came up with it, but he built a working steam engine almost 2,000 years ago. Greek inventor Katesibos spent the majority of his career working on compressed air technologies, and Hero built on his work to create the Aeola pile, which is also known as the Heron engine. In essence, the engine is a sphere that spins on its axis as water is boiled either within or beneath it emitting steam through nozzles as it spins and thereby generating thrust. Hero viewed it as a little more than a curiosity as he couldn't think of a useful application for it, but Taku al-Din picked up on his work 1500 years later and was credited with inventing the steam engine. In reality, all he'd done was slightly amend a much older design, one that ought to have been inconceivable to the people of the time. In Saudi Arabia's Taima Oasis, you'll find the Al Nasla Rock Formation, a striking looking megalith that appears to have been split perfectly in two, using some form of cutting technology, and then mounted on a rocky pedestal. The official explanation for its unusual appearance is that it's a freak occurrence that happened naturally. But not everybody is so sure. There's an engraving of what may be a horse or a camel on one side of the rock, one which was made around 4,000 years ago. So it's clear that our ancestors did at least a little sculpting work on the rock at that time and may have been responsible for slicing it in half with such laser-like precision. Obviously, they didn't have lasers at their disposal, so the big question is how could they have gone about it? The answer, unfortunately, is that we have no idea. Perhaps that's why scientists would prefer us to believe that it split in half due to weathering, and hope that we don't ask any further questions about it. The entire site of Baalbek in Lebanon is both an archaeological wonder and an archaeological mystery, but it's the megalithic cut stones in the quarry that have provided us with the biggest mystery of all. One of them, the Southern Rock, weighs approximately 900 tons. There's no clear indication of what the rocks were needed for, why they were cut at such a size, and how anyone living in ancient times could possibly have dreamed of moving them anywhere after they were cut. The western rock is even bigger, weighing around 1,100 tons. One theory says that they were supposed to become part of Baalbek's Trilithon, but as the site of the Trilithon is uphill from the quarry, an inconceivable amount of power would be required to drag or push them up the hill. 
We can't even say for sure who performed the cutting work. The ancient Romans are generally credited for it, but we haven't seen any evidence of them attempting to quarry such enormous megaliths anywhere across their old empire. This would be considered too difficult a construction project to attempt today, let alone a thousand years ago. The most common misconception about the Archimedes screw is that it was invented by Archimedes. It wasn't. He merely recorded the device as a point of interest during a visit to Egypt in 234 BCE. Its true origin is potentially much older, and its inventor is unknown. It's the oldest known design of a water displacement pump in the world, thought to have been used to pump water out of the Nile and perhaps even to irrigate the hanging gardens of Babylon, is a system of tubes wound tightly around a cylinder. As the screw rotates, water is lifted through the tubes and driven up through the device until it comes out the other end. There's possible evidence of the existence of screws like this in an inscription of Shanacharib, an Assyrian king who lived 2,700 years ago. If the interpretation of the inscription is accurate, then the technology existed 500 years before Archimedes, and it may not have been even new then. Who came up with the device? Where did they do it? And more importantly, how? Our next mysterious creation has two names, neither of which tell us anything about its true nature. Some people call it the Nimrud lens, and others call it the Layered lens. Depending on who you believe, it may be part of an ancient telescope and would predate the official invention of the telescope in the Netherlands in 1608 by several thousand years. The object was discovered in 1850 in an ancient Assyrian palace in land that now belongs to Iraq. The lens works as a magnifying glass with a factor of three, precisely the same level of magnification that the first telescope allowed for. It might have been a sort of burning glass, a means of starting fires using the rays of the sun, and even that would have to be considered an impressive invention 3,000 years ago. As has been noted by several historians, though, the Assyrians had a knowledge of astronomy that appears to have been well ahead of their time. Might it have been because they were using Nimrud lenses to study the stars and planets? We've seen an ancient central heating system built by the Romans, and now here's an ancient irrigation system built by the Chinese. This is Du Gayan, and it's the oldest irrigation system in the world that doesn't involve the use of dams. Even though it's more than 2,200 years old, the ancient construction within what's now the Sichuan province is still used today to provide water for 50 cities within the province. A visionary called Li Bing was responsible for the creation of the dam. He realized that the frequent flooding of the Minjiang River was caused by melting snow running down from the mountains, and he created an artificial levee to redirect the flow of water onto the Chengdu Plain. Doing so involved cutting a channel straight through the Mount Yuli. Back then, there were no explosives, and so Li Bing heated the rock up with fire and then cooled it with water to crack it, and then had his workers scrape it all away. It took eight years to finish the work, but the design remains unchanged all these centuries later. Li Bing seemed to have an understanding of geology and waterways that was far beyond anybody else alive at the time. The design of giant norias of Hama looks familiar to us because we're used to seeing modern ferris wheels at fairgrounds. These aren't ferris wheels though. They're huge water wheels that might be up to 2,400 years old. 17 of the wheels are still standing today, although some have suffered damage because of the recent conflicts with Syria. They were once part of an irrigation system that served Hama in ancient times, carrying water into the city. The precise date of their invention is a secret lost to time. Most people agree that they date back at least as far as the medieval Arab era, but a mosaic that's been discovered in the nearby ancient city of Apamia suggests that they may be even older. A very similar design to the Norias appear on the mosaic, and the mosaic has been dated to 469 BCE. Sadly, the wheels serve only an aesthetic purpose today, 
but the complexity of their design is staggering for a civilization that lived more than two millennia ago. If you can look at the images of the Cejute monolith in Peru and ascertain the meaning behind the more than 200 unique designs that have been carved onto its surface, you'll be solving a mystery that's been puzzling experts for centuries. The monolith is in Abenque, the site that was densely populated by the Inca between the 15th and 16th centuries. It's by far the most interesting artifact at the site, and it's covered with intricately carved cats, frogs, reptiles, shellfish, canals, and tunnels. There are even terraces and what appear to be temples or houses. Because of this, some people believe that it may have been a topographic model of the area it stood in onto which the Inca poured water to observe how it flowed down the tunnels and channels. Based on their findings, they may then have carved similar channels and canals into the land around them for irrigation. That's a great theory, but there's a lack of evidence of any such work on the surrounding land to support it. What else could it be? Was there a secretive water cult operating there? Or are we all just failing to interpret these ancient symbols correctly? Back in the days before the invention of the telephone, sending important information quickly over a long distance was difficult. Smoke signals or torch lights could be used to convey very simple messages, but they could only communicate brief ideas, not long pieces of information. Greek writer and inventor Aeneas wasn't satisfied with that situation, so in 350 BCE, he decided to come up with a better way of communicating. His solution was the hydraulic telegraph, a sort of message-in-a-bottle system with more nuance. Aeneas created vessels that could be filled with water and rods, and in the rods, a series of pre-agreed coded messages could be stored. The messages on the rods were identical in all of the vessels. When two parties that were separated by distance would communicate, they would signal each other with torchlight, and then simultaneously pull out the plugs of the vessels and allow the water to drain out. When the correct message had been revealed by the water flowing out, a second torchlight message would be sent to confirm that the plug should be reinserted and the message should now be read. It would be considered primitive now, but it was a huge leap forward for the Greek military of the time. When you were a child, you may have played with a basic version of a telephone consisting of two cups connected by a long piece of string. If you did, you probably didn't know that you were imitating a piece of technology developed by the Chimu Empire around 1200 years ago. Only one example of the ancient telephone has ever been discovered, and it was found in Peru during the 1930s. It's now safely behind glass in the Smithsonian National Museum in Maryland, USA. The two cups are connected by a long cord made from twine and gourd, covering a distance of 75 feet. It probably allowed two neighbors to communicate with one another, or perhaps even a family to communicate from one side of a large house to the other without shouting. As only one such device has ever been found, we're unable to say whether such devices were common feature of Chimu homes, but they're a remarkable invention for a civilization that, as far as we know, didn't even have a written language. There are many myths attached to the Vauvel paper machines. They're said to be able to calculate the date and time, which seems reasonable, but would you believe that they could also calculate the concept of absolute truth? The man who invented them certainly wanted people to think so. That man was Roman Lule of Majorca, one of the most respected scientists and philosophers in Europe during the 13th and 14th centuries. In design and function, they're a little like astrolabs. But astrolabs were clockwork and made of steel. Making a functional machine like this out of paper is astonishing. Aside from being a philosopher, Lul also saw himself as a religious visionary and argued that Christianity, Islam, and Judaism should all be united as one faith, worshiping one God. To use his vovels, the user had to align the machine with the pole star and center the crossed circles on the face of the vovel. Using this method, 
it was apparently possible to determine your location, the time, and the date. At the same time, the newly oriented Vauvel would also display a compelling argument for the existence of God. It's a very strange creation, and it isn't surprising that 300 years later, they were banned because people thought they were being used in dark arts rituals. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.